Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure for me to be here in Bangalore. I always love the audience here. And today I'm going to talk about coding that sparks joy with Quarkus. I don't know how many of you know Maria Kondo. Not that much. But Maria Kondo is a Japanese uh, personal organizer, and that's where uh, that's uh, from her that I took the sparks joy term. Uh, basically, she tries to say to you that there are some things in your life, uh, and if you want to check if you really should keep something, you should uh, take a look at that. If it really sparks joy in your life, then you should keep it, or else you just should thank it and leave it behind. So when we're talking about coding that sparks joy, basically we're talking that there are, there are some coding practices that you should be leaving behind if it doesn't spark joy, and I really believe that Quarkus sparks joy in your life. My name is Edson Yanaga. My Twitter handle is at Yanaga. And let me say some fun things about me. First of all, I'm a Brazilian Japanese, and typically not the Brazilian you would expect, but um, I'm 100% Japanese, but I was born and raised in Brazil. Now I live in the US and North Carolina. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP. As far as Google can tell me, I was the first and still the only one. I'm also uh, the DevConf Rockstar. Uh, the DevConf is the largest software development conference in Latin America. Every year they have like 30,000 people, and they granted me this award uh, two years ago. And my Twitter handle, at Yanaga, just in case you want to follow me, I talk a lot about Java, DevOps, microservices, software craftsmanship, and uh, other nice stuff. And when we're discussing about Java programming, let's talk about some myths and facts first. We know Java used to be slow, and uh, the fact is that Java developers are very good in social media because, you know, whenever you have to try a Maven build or try to deploy our artifact to our WebSphere application and try to, try to wait for warm-up and then later check if the result of our uh, coding is working, uh, it takes some time, that takes like sometimes 15 minutes, 30 minutes. That's why we usually have time to check Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, and any other social media. And we then even have even time for coffee and go to the restaurant. When we come back, it's not finished yet. So that's why we always have the excuse of my code is compiling, my project is building. But it's in the past. With Quarkus, everything can be different because Quarkus really brings you developer joy which means that when you're developing software with Quarkus, you don't have to wait for it to be ready. You just save your file, and it's automatically there. So if you used to be jealous for, uh, about the Ruby developers or the JavaScript developers, they had the ability to just save their files and automatically see the results of their changes, well, with Java, now it's possible. And in my particular opinion is that Quarkus is the best thing that ever happened to the Java platform in the past 15 years because finally we can be uh, very productive when trying to develop a, a, um, a Java project. We can be very productive to trying to build our new microservices in this new platform. But I don't want to just talk about it. I really want to show how things are great. And I hope that after my talk, you'll be able to check out the project and see for yourselves how Quarkus is great. So let's go to the live coding part of this talk. I want to go here to my terminal. Let's see if I'm in the right place. Yes. So let's create a folder called Dev Nation. And here, let's try to create our first Quarkus project. The easiest way for us to create the Quarkus project is using the Maven plugin. And before anybody asks me, yes, we support Gradle. But I'm a Maven user, so I make bad choices. So let's try to create this project using Maven. So when I tap it, it will ask for some basic Maven information, like group ID, com Red Hat developers, artifact ID, let's call it dev nation version, a rest resource, yes, please. Uh, let's stick to the default, and it's running. So let's try to open now with my IDE. And this is going to be the slowest operation you're going to see the entire day, importing your project into your IDE. Let's make it bigger. OK. So if I check here, Quarkus created this example, hello world endpoint. So now I'm going to start my favorite Quarkus feature, which is development modes. So whenever I do this, Quarkus compile, Quarkus dev, I'm enabling, enabling development mode. So now Quarkus is listening for changes in my file system. So whenever I save a file and issue a request to my server, Quarkus is going to restart it. And 
development mode now, right now is started in approximately one second, which for me is very slow. We can do much better than that because Quarkus, when it's warm, it usually should take around 100 milliseconds for every one of its reloads. And we are not doing any kind of magic here. Like we don't do any class loading magic, some proxying or something like that. Quarkus is so fast that it was much easier for, you to for us to just stop the server and start it over again. So let's see how it works. First, let's check if Quarkus is working. So if I go here, localhost 8080, yes, Quarkus is working. Let's go to slash hello. Yes, hello. Hello is working there. So if I go to my source code, and I check instead of hello, let's try to do some hola, which is hello in Portuguese and in Spanish too. Go back to my browser. Yes, yeah, it's already updated. How long did Quarkus take to refresh? 400 milliseconds. Well, we warm them up. We can get better than that. Let's go back to my code. And one of the great thing, uh, good things about Quark is that this is a traditional JAXR access point, a synchronous one, but if I want to do some asynchronous programming, I can do that too with Quarkus. What do I need to do? Let's try to create another endpoint. Uh, this one is going to produce some text plane, and I need to change the path. Let's try to do that slash async, and I'm going to return a different type of object. A completion stage, a, st a st string. And now I can do this, completable future, supply async. Hello, um, async. OK, I just typed this asynchronous code, I save my file, go back to my browser, and hello, it's already working. And hello, async. Hello, I'm async. How long did Quarkus take? Let's check. 200 milliseconds, we're getting better. Go back here to my codes. What else can we do? Well, it, these are just boring, plain text, static strings. So maybe we should be able to customize the strings that we're returning through a configuration property. How can I do that? Let's try to add a string greeting. And instead of returning just hola, I can return a greeting. And I want this property to be inject dynamically. So, and I say that the name of this property is going to be greeting. I go back here to my browser, and oops, I have an error, because I said that I need a configuration property, but I didn't provide one. What can I do to fix it? Well, hello. Uh, let's go back here to my code. And if I go to my application properties file, then I can provi provision uh, values. So let's try to add some French, bonjour. Save the file, go back here. It's already working. OK, go, ba go back to my hello resource file. So, but since we're using Java 8 and MicroProfile config API, suppose that I didn't want to use just a plain string. If I didn't provide any value, I could also be providing a default value. Let's say hi um, default. So if I go back here to my application properties and I made a typo, I can go back to my browser and hi, I'm default because there is none there. But just in case I don't want to, to use a default value, I could also use an optional. So if, I'm, uh, if I import the right class, yes. So suppose that I don't want to provide a uh, uh, default value, but I, use, I want to use Java optional. Hi, I'm optional. OK, so I want to use the Java, op Java 8 optionals. Go back here. Hi, I'm optional. It's already working. OK. And this would start took 190 milliseconds. Yes, we're getting close to what we want. But you might argue that this is a very simple JAXRS point, a REST endpoint returning text plane. And it's not that interesting because no real Java, no application, no Java application is really real if we don't add a database to that. Like 99% of the Java developers worldwide need to deal with a relational database every day. So let's try to add these capabilities to our demo application. So I'm going to stop development mode, and I need to add new features to my Quarkus applications. These new features in Quarkus are called extensions. And luckily, we have a lot of extensions to be able to play with. So if I go then type Quarkus list extensions, I'm able to get a list of all the features available for Quarkus right now. So for example, I can use uh, Reactive, Vertex. I can use Swagger for, rest, uh, for, for testing my end endpoints. I can be Reactive. What else? Open API, tracing, everything else. But the ones I'm interested in right now, I want to use JSON. So I'm going to add this JSONB. 
I want to use uh, databases, so maybe I want to add some uh, Hibernate. I also want to add some uh, database drivers, so let me find, maybe I can add the MariaDB driver. So let's go and do it. Uh, the easiest way for you to add an extension, you can always edit your Pwn XML file to add extensions, but it's much easier with the plugin. So if I go to Quarkus, add extension, and I type the extensions that I want. It doesn't need to be an exact match. You can type like just a substring, and it will automatically try to figure out which extension do you want. So I want to add some Hibernate JP JPA, but I want to show you a, a new API that we're providing with Quarkus called Panache on top of Hibernate and JPA, so I'll add Panache. What else? I need a JDBC driver, so I'm going to add MariaDB. Oh, by the way, do you know the story behind the, the name MariaDB? No? So let me get, try to quickly explain that. One of the most popular open source um, uh, database servers is MySQL. And initially, the developer is, I think he's Swedish. And you know developers are very good in naming projects. So he, when he had to, he created a database project, and he had to name that. Well, let's try to find something. And oh, I have a daughter. I had her daughter, my daughter is named me. So I'm going to name it in MySQL, but in English it became MySQL. So the popular became, uh, the, the project became very popular. Later he sold the project to Sun. Uh, then Oracle bought Sun, and seven years later he wasn't happy with the development of the MySQL project, and he decided to fork it. When I forked MySQL, well, I need another name. So, but now I have another daughter, my daughter is called Maria, so he called it MariaDB. And MariaDB is 100% compatible with MySQL, so we're using the 100% open source version of the fork, MariaDB. I also want to add some JSON, so I'm going to add REST Easy JSONB. I also want to test my endpoint. So I want to document my REST endpoint using Open API. I want to publish the schema. And I want to test my REST endpoint using a beautiful interface called Swagger. It should be enough for now. Let's see if I type it everything correctly. Nope. Uh, probably made a typo which one. I couldn't find REST Easy because that's, I have an additional A. So let's fix this typo. It's rest easy. So processing again. Yes, now build successful. I added my dependency successfully, my extensions. I can start development mode again. And go back to my IDE. How do I use uh, JPA on top of this? First, the easiest way for, you, uh, for me to use Hibernate JPA, if you ever create a, use it in any JPA, you first you need to create an, ent to create an entity. So I'm going to create an entity called developers because we love developers. And as you know, any entity needs to be annotated with its entity. Then I would need to provide a very boring ID, like ID at generated value. But since I want to show you the cool stuff that Quarkus provides for you, I don't need to provide this ID. Since we're going to use this new feature called Panache, I can basically just extend a Panache entity and the ID is going to be provisioned uh, automatically for me. Now I need to add some properties. So I would say private string name because every developer has a name and I would need to generate the getters and setters. But you know, it's just boring and think about that. If every time you're creating a property in your entity, you're just exposing everything as getters and setters, there is no real encapsulation. So instead of doing that, and I know some people might be uh, surprised about that or even complain about that. But with Panache, you don't have to provide private properties and public getters and setters. You can use a, just a public field. And you may think, oh, that's against everything that I learned in the past 20 years. But uh, with Panache, it allows you to code like a public field. But at runtime, we'll generate the getters and setters for you and use the getters and setters. So it's a matter of option. If you want to use a public field, that's OK. If you want to use the private field with getters and setters, it's also OK. But at runtime, you will be using the getters and setters. In fact, if you generate your own getters and setters, Panache will use your, own get your getters and setters, or else we'll generate them for you. So let's try to use the public fields for now. So it should be good. So I have an entity, but I need to configure my database connection. How do I do that? I go to application properties, and I type some Quarkus properties. So let's say that I need the Quarkus 
data source URL is going to be JDBC, MySQL, oops, localhost, and my database is SparkJoy. I need to type Quarkus. Data source username is going to be SparkJoy. Quarkus data source. Password Sparks Joy, Quarkus Data Source Driver, uh, Org MariaDB JDBC Driver, and the last feature, the last configuration property, is going to be one of my favorite ones, Hibernate. And database mission updates. Uh, never use this in production. I, since I'm using a demo, I want Hibernate to be updating my database as soon as I'm coding my application. So it should be good for now. Let's see what happens. I go back here to my endpoint and issue a refresh. Uh, if I show here, well, I missed the magic because I wanted to show that my database was empty. Maybe we can try to do that again. So if I show the tables, Yes, you know they already have a developer and then a Hibernate sequence. Let's try to drop, drop everything. Drop table developer. Drop table. Oops, typo. So I don't have anything. I'm going to stop, start Quarkus again. Okay, show tables, it's already there. So Quarkus connected and generated everything for me. If I try to describe my developer database, yes, I have an ID and a name. So let's, let's try to test this endpoint. For me to test this database, since I'm create, I want to generate a REST endpoint, let's try to create a developer resource. And this is going to be a path slash developer is going to provide me first. Let's try to return all of the developers in my database. So developers list. And this is the first feature of Panache. So traditionally, I would have to inject an entity manager, create a query, return all of the developers in my database. But since I'm using Panache, Panache, in this case, is using the active record style of a persistence. The two most popular persistent patterns in, in, the, uh, in the development world are active record and repositories. With repositories, well, we're used to that, but with active record, if you ever uh, developed using Ruby on Rails or Play Framework in the Java space, you know that active record blends the entities with the persistent methods, okay? Some people might argue that then your entity is doing too much, but active records is very good for a very simple use case such as CRUDs. Uh, in the other hand, repositories, maybe they are better suited for more complex business uh, domain models. So, but since it's just a simple CRUD, it's very interesting for me to use the active record style. So what do I need to do to retrieve all of the entities, all of the developers in my database? I just type developer dot list all. Of course, you would never do this in production because we're fetching all of the entities in your database, but since it's just a demo, it's okay for now. In the real world, you would page or would limit the results or you would filter them, something like that. So I want to, uh, it's a get, and I'm going to produce media type application JSON. And if I did everything correctly, I can go here to my browser and say slash developer. It's running. But it's returning nothing because my database is empty. I could go back here to my database and insert some, some, some rows in my database, but that would be just boring. I want to test that through my REST endpoint. So let's try to insert some developers through my REST endpoint. So how do I create that? I want to create, uh, I'm going to do that through a post statement, which is going to produce application JSON, and also is going to consume application JSON. And for this, I want to return a developer, and I'm going to receive a developer too. And if I want to be able to persist a developer, I just need to make sure the developer ID is no. And if I want to persist that, I just type developer.persist. Okay? And it should be enough and return the developer. 
And if I go back to my browser, you can see that, oops, I made a mistake. I forgot to add a semicolon. But luckily, Quarkus, every time I'm issuing a new request, Quarkus is recompiling my project, and it already showed me a very interesting message saying that at developer resource line 22, you forgot a semicolon. If I go back here, add the semicolon, and it should be, oops, it should be working. Okay, let's try to test that post endpoint. And if you ever try to use a, a, a and test uh, post endpoint, you know that I would need like a Firefox plugin, something like Postman, or we need to create a very complicated like curl command, which is very cumbersome and error prone. But since we're using Quarkus, I can just go here to my browser and tap localhost. Swagger UI. So it's going to provide uh, me a very nice interface to test my REST endpoints. Swagger is consuming the Open API schema that has been providing at this endpoint. So the Open API is uh, generating the schema for my REST endpoints and it's showing me that yes, you have a get developer, a post developer, a get hello, and get hello async. I'm interested in this one post slash developer. So it already provides me an example value, the schema, and I'm interested in this button. Try it out. So let's how, see how does it work. Quarkus is saying, well, you have the value. Maybe you should, could provide. I'm going to type Yanaga here and try to execute that. And the response is 500, which means I had a bug. So I have a very long message here. But if you look at the stack trace, it's going to tell me that you are trying to persist an entity and into the database. database but you didn't provide a transaction. So with Quarkus, it's very easy for me to fix this bug. I just go back here to my code, add an add transaction. Oops. Save the file, go back here, and let's try to execute that again. Where's the button? Execute. And now it's returning me at 200. And just in case I want to copy paste this curl statement, it's going to work on the CLI too. <laughs> And the response body was, yes, it's persisted. Now I have an ID number one, and the name is Yanaga. If I go back here to my get rest endpoint and refresh, and Yanaga is already there. Let's try to add some more developers to make it more interesting. So I'm going to add Burr and execute that. I'm going to add Skamash too. And Execute, so go back here. Yes, everybody is persisted. So that's how it works with uh, Hibernate, Panache, Swagger, and JoxRS. Good. What else can we do? You might, well, we're using Active Record. I didn't like Active Record. I'm a very old, uh, old style Java developer. I want to use repositories. Don't worry, we got you covered. We can use repositories too, and we can help you to build your repositories. So let's try to create one. I'm going to try to add a new developer repository. And if I want to implement a repository with using Quarkus and Panache, I just have to say, well, this is going to be an application scope with Bean, and I need to implement the Panache. Panache repository interface of a developer. As, as soon as I do that, I already have all of the persistence methods, find, persist, merge, and all the things that you use it to. But if I want to create custom methods, I can do that too. So let's try to add some business logic here. I want to return all of the developers that are Brazilian Japanese. I don't expect to find many. So uh, let's try to create a custom query. I also have this default methods here, and if you ever create an HTL or JPQL query, you know that you would say, well, select star from developer, where, the, uh, where, um, uh, where developer something, but it's just boring, but since we're creating a repository, and I know that it's a developer repository, I don't have to tap this boring part, I can just go directly to the properties, because Panache is assuming if you have a developer repository, you're probably curing developer entities. So I can just type, I don't have to type the from. I just can say, well, developer name, like, and if I'm doing correctly, uh, I hope I can type it correctly. Then one, again, I'm going to create like concat, and the name needs to be Yanaga. And it's going to return a list. So if I did everything correctly, I can go back here to my developer repository. 
and say that, well, inst instead of returning everybody, I could add a query parameter. And I could say that this parameter here is Brazilian. It's going to be Boolean. Brazilian, and I'll say that if Brazilian return developer, repository, oh, I don't have an instance. What do I have to do? Just inject that. Developer repository at inject. So return developer repository dot find the Brazilian Japanese one. And if everything is right, I can go back here to my browser, query again. Yes, it's working. Let's try to add this parameter. Brazilian equals to true. Yes, it's returning only myself. So it's working. So that's how easy it is for you to use a repository, inject a repository, and consume the repository custom methods if you want to. So remember that I said that Panache is creating the getters and setters for me, but let's get back to developer. And now I have a new requirement. I want that uh, all of the developer names should be uppercase. Then I can just do get name and return get to uppercase. I go here, save my file, go back here, and everybody is already uppercase. Let's try to add another property to my entity. I would say that developers also have a favorite framework which is Quarkus every these days for everybody. I add this property, go back here, and oh, this property is not, show, not showing up because the property is empty. If I query my database, you see that favorite framework is no for everybody. Let's try to update here my database. Never do this in production, please. And update without worm. Set favorite framework equals to Quarkus. I update that, go back to my browser, and everybody's there. But I now I have another requirement. Favorite framework should be lowercase for everybody. Well, I don't want to use the default uh, getter that Quarkus is generating for me, so let's try to generate another custom getter, get favorite framework, but this, this time I want it to be lowercase. I save the file, go back here, and everything is lowercase. And how long did Quarkus take for to do that? Let's go back to my terminal. And it's taking approximately 300 milliseconds. And to be very honest, most of this time, his Quarkus is trying to acquire a JDBC connection to my database. Uh, but you would argue that for a Java application is pretty fast enough. Well, not the traditional Java application server that you use it to, or any other Java stack. Okay. So, you know, if I understand the question correctly, how how can I compare from Podnash repository with Spring Data JPA for something? Okay, well, they're similar. Yeah. I would say that with, uh, yes, you have the same methods that you would have in any repository. It's standard. Uh, you can, yeah, if you go here to, if you go back to the stack, you have persist, delete, uh, save. They're all implemented as default methods. So it's, it's uh, basically the same um, uh, approach. Yeah. What we don't do, and some people might argue, uh, yeah, well, I'm a Spring user, a Spring fan, uh, fan too. What you could do, like Spring, uh, Spring Data uh, allows you to type the strings here and just create like custom query methods. That's a reasonable approach. We prefer the code, and since Panache does that, um, you learn that with Quarkus, we validate everything at build time. If you just type the string, we'll have an error at runtime. With Quarkus, you can validate all of this at runtime, uh, at build time, for example. So you don't run and then see the error. Uh, like if you have a, a we're creating, uh, for example, Gavin King, the, the creator of Hibernate, he's developing. He didn't merge that yet, but you're going to be able to validate all of these queries at build time. So before you run your application, you know if it, the queries are right or wrong. And we have other approaches that create the, you know, the queries at runtime, like Spring Data. You have to run it to realize that it's wrong. Okay, so here you have, uh, and Qu uh, Quarkus, for example, uh, has a much um, faster feedback loop, so that's one of the arguments. But again, it's a matter of taste, okay? I'm not arguing that one approach is better than the other. I'm just saying that we can validate everything at build time. The question here is that we're tying our implementation to Panache and uh, JPA in the specification, okay? Oh, yes, I completely agree. The queries, uh, are oh, mostly likely JPA com uh, compatible because we're adding the front part, but uh, JPA is the specification. If you use Spring Data JPA, you're tying yourself to implementation too. So no difference. 
Hibernate is the official JPA implementation. Well, oh, not the official, the first uh, JPA implementation. Okay, so behind the scenes, we're using Hibernate, we're using JPA, so yeah, it's all uh, standard JPA, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, let's try to add some more features to my application. So if I just stop here, what can I add? But before, let's try to do something more interesting. I'm going to create another endpoint. Let's call this one remote. So let's go back here and try to create a new folder called remote. And let's try to create Maybe I'm plugging. I want to use a specific version because we're, we're releasing a new version of Quarkus every two weeks, so every two weeks we have new features. So I want to stick to a version that I've been using before. I want to call this artifact remote. Rest and point, yes, please. Stick to the default and go back. Yes, I'm already good. So let's try to run this. Quarkus dev. Go back here, localhost 8080. Yes, it's running, so let's try to build this application. So I want to package this application. Running the tests. Yes, okay, and I generate the artifact. Took me approximately six seconds. Well, most of this time was running the test. But if I go to the target folder, you see that Quarkus generated some artifacts. First one. This jar, which is the jar generated by the Maven jar plugin, okay, it's taking 4.8 kilobytes. And I have the runner jar, which is my executable jar, and it's consuming 91 kilobytes of size. So you can see Quarkus genera generates very tiny executable jars, and you might be wondering, let's see if it works. And go back here. Yes, it's still working, and you might be wondering, oh, it means it's only 90 kilobytes of disk space. No, that's not all. If I go back here again, you can see that Quarkus also created this lib folder for me, and if I go here to my lib folder, I have all of the dependencies required for my application, and how much space is it taking? It's taking approximately 7.9 megabytes. So in less than eight megabytes of disk space, you have this executable application. And you might be arguing, why didn't I generate a fat jar? Well, we know that in this new cloud native container serverless world, generating fat jars is a very bad idea because your dependencies don't change that often. But every time you package a fat jar, you have a different artifact where your business of the code, which is like five kilobytes of side, uh, is everything that changes it, but you're packaging your dependencies, which can be big, over and over again. So uh, in the container-based world, in the cloud-native world, it's much more efficient if you're using containers. You just add your lib folder in a separate layer, and you add your dependency in the, late, in the last layer. So you can cache the lib folder, because it doesn't, doesn't change that often. And every time you generate in a new container, a new artifact, the only thing that is changing is the last layer. You are just five kilobytes of, uh, or in this case, 90 kilobytes of business application logic. So it's, this is much more efficient. And you might be thinking that, oh, it's too hard, this container thing. I need to generate my Docker files, custom Docker files. We know that these days everybody wants to play with containers. So you don't have to think about what is the best approach for creating these containers. We already provide the Docker files for you. It's just a matter of, for you to choose which option do you want, and we'll generate the Docker files for you, the containers for you. Okay, so we already have the Docker files. You, all, you even have the instructions here in the comments, how do I build my image, and you should be fine. Another feature that I want to show using Quarkus is that we can generate native images. For example, if you, use, if you want to use GraalVM to generate um, uh, native images, if you ever use the GraalVM, you know that it's very complicated for you to generate uh, native images in any project. In fact, and actually, most of the projects, they don't support GraalVM. Uh, because of the restrictions of GraalVM. But if you're using Quarkus, it's very easy to, to generate a native image. You just need to go here, package, and enable the native profile. I just added, uh, enable the native profile and start the compilation. It's, it's going to take like less than a minute. And while it's compiling, I want to show another feature of Quarkus. Let's try to show some numbers. So, uh, as I said before, Quarkus was created for this new cloud-native 
cloud native and serverless, and it, it offers you a container first approach. You know that I was worried as a Java developer, I was worried that before retiring, I would have to learn a new technology because Java wouldn't survive in the next 20 or 25 years. But I'm very happy with Quarkus. We've given the Java platform at least another 20 years of, of, of life. And why is that? Uh, in the past five years in particular, I've seen a lot of developers moving to other technologies, for example, Go or Node.js, because these technologies were much more suitable for this new cloud native and, uh, and serverless world. And why is that? In this cloud native world, you know that memory became the new gold. Memory is the most expensive resource in the cloud computing environments. And why is that? Because CPU and network are very easy for you to share over time. And storage, disk space became very cheap. But with memory, if you have like two gigabytes of RAM, you're going to pay for that two gigabytes of RAM uh, for the whole time. And if your application is consuming 500 megabytes of RAM every time, you could uh, put at most four applications on that amount of memory. So one of the most important measures that we have these days in this cloud computing world is throughput per megabyte of RAM. And thinking about that, Java had a ba very bad radio. Like Java consumes a lot of memory and takes a lot of time to boot up. And think these days, we're thinking about horizontal scalability. We want to be able to spin up a lot of instances when we have a high workload. And we want to shut them down when the workload is gone. But sometimes, if your application takes like two minutes to boot up and then another five minutes to warm up, then you have a lot of requests. You start to steam, spin up more instances. When the, the, these JVMs are warm enough, the workload is gone. You already lost your request. You already lost your sales or something like that. So Java was, wasn't a, the best option for these scenarios. And that's why most developers decided to choose another, other approaches using Go or Node.js. But what changed it? With Quarkus, you don't have to wait. You can be super fast and super small in any of the options that you have for running your applications. So let's try to show you some numbers. For memory consumption, and we're not talking about Java heap size, we're talking about resident size, which is the total amount of memory that your process is consuming at runtime. And if you think about that, Quarkus, if you're using Quarkus with GraalVM for a REST endpoint, Quarkus is consuming 30 megabytes of RAM. If you're using Quarkus with Hotspot OpenDigitK, it's consuming 74 megabytes of RAM. And the traditional cloud native stack in the Java world that you're used to is consuming at least 140 megabytes of RAM to execute a very simple REST endpoint. So depending on the scenario, so Quarkus can be 10 times smaller, actually on average, Quarkus is 10 times smaller than the traditional cloud native stack that you're used to. Let's try to add some real use case, for example, JPA. REST plus JPA, Quarkus is going to consume 30 35 megabytes of RAM using Growl. If you're using Hotspot and OpenGDK, you're going to consume 130 megabytes. And the traditional cloud native stack, at least 218 megabytes. This is for memory size. Let's talk about time to first uh, successful response. Some people try to measure startup time. Startup time is not a good measure because what really matters in cloud native world is that I'm booting my application. I want to know how much time does it take to respond successfully to my first request. So you might be some other uh, frameworks or applications. Oh, let's try to apply some lazy things. Well, when you're servicing the, lazy, the first request, you're paying the lazy the cost anyway. So the important thing is that how much does my application take to be up warm and responding quickly to my request. Uh, if you're using Quarkus for just a rest endpoint, using GraalVM, it takes 14 milliseconds for you to respond to first request. We did some measurements and at, at, in production, at runtime, we're as fast and as, as small as Go. We have similar numbers. Go is going to start in the tenths of milliseconds too. We start in 14 milliseconds. If you're using Quarkus plus OpenGDK, it's going to take 750 milliseconds. And the traditional cloud native stack is going to take at least 4.3 seconds to um, reply successfully to the first request. Let's try to add some JPA. If you're using Quarkus plus GraalVM, it takes 55 milliseconds for first request. If you're using OpenGDK, it's going to take 2.5 seconds. And the traditional cloud native stack is going to take at least 9.5 seconds. So that's how fast and small Quarkus can be at runtime. Question? 
Uh, the question is, uh, I understand from traditional land as well as Quarkus point of view how the numbers look like. How does it look in terms of if you compare with Go or Angular or Node.js kind of application? Okay. Cost request as well as the startup time. That's mm -hmm. the question. Well, compared to Go, we don't have these publisher numbers because we only compare with, uh, we only compared with the Java space. But I think that at the keynote, Burper, for example, compared to Node.js, right? And with Node.js, it takes like, Quarkus is approximately like four times uh, smaller than uh, typical Node.js Node application. I don't have the numbers, but it's that's approximately size. And if you, uh, in our like known scientific measurements, it's also si significantly faster. And with Go, at least in my experiments, we have similar size and uh, 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 response time for the first request. Go is slightly like 5% smaller and faster, but we think it's a very reasonable trade-off if you're using Java because you have a much larger ecosystem, okay? But it's not like unofficial measurements. We try to avoid as much like benchmarking with anything else because, uh, well, every time, you do some benchmarking, you have a lot of bike shedding. So that's why we don't publish like official numbers. Okay, and that's what I had to say about Quarks. So if everything, yes, my, bu my build is successful, let's try to run on my machine and see how it behaves. So if I go back here to my target folder, you see that now I have this binary file, which is consuming 20 megabytes of disk space. If I try to run this application, Yes, Fire, I want to allow this to run. Yes, it took nine milliseconds to boot up. Let's see if it's working. And uh, yes, it's still running. And if I want to know how much memory it's consuming, so I have here, and it's consuming 14 megabytes of resident set size. What is resident set size? Some people think about uh, just heap size. Well, heap size is one of the most important measurements in a Java application, but you need to take the heap size, the meta space, the out of heaps, disk space, uh, the stack size, and the thread size too. When you add all of that, you have the resident set size. And in this particular Quarkus application, we have a, like a six megabytes uh, uh, heap size. Have you ever wondered if it would be possible to run a Java application with a six megabyte RAM heap size or consuming 40 megabytes of RAM for resident set size? It used to be impossible with Quarkus. Yes, we can run it in such a small amount of memory and respond quickly to the first request in just a very few milliseconds, okay? You can note that nine milliseconds to boot up, but I would have to add the, 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 uh, the milliseconds required to process the first request, okay? So it's running in native mode. I want to add some more capabilities to my application. So right now, uh, I want to run this application, but I want a different port. So I'll keep this application running on port 881. Yes. Let's test it. 881. Yes, it's running OK, and it's going to be slash hello. So let's try to, try to use some typed REST client approach. So if I go back here to my original Quarkus application. I want to add more capabilities, so I want to add more extensions. Extensions, I want to add the REST clients and the uh, fault tolerance API. So let's see if I type it correctly. Yes, everything is green, emojis for the win. So I can open my project. Let's try to open the dev mode. I open dev mode, go back here to my ID, and on the hello resource. Let's try to add some remote invocation to my new endpoint. So if I want to create a type address client, first I need to create an interface, which is going to hello client. It's going to be an interface. And this interface, I need to register a REST client, and I need to mimic the remote endpoint using my annotation, so the path is going to be slash hello. And for this one, I want a get, is going to produce media type dot, oops, media type text plane, um, public string, 
say hello. Okay, so this REST endpoint, this REST client should be good. It should be similar to the one that I have remotely. How do I consume that? I can go back here to my hello resource. Let's try to create a path called slash remote at get. Let's try to produce some media type dot explain to public string hello remote. And now I'm going to consume my hello client. So let's try to inject it. I want to inject uh, my hello client interface. But since it's a REST client, I need to add another annotation at REST client. And I can consume here saying return hello client, say hello. Okay. Is it good? Let's try to test my endpoint. Go back here to localhost 8080. Hello, remote. And I have an error. And why is that? I created my remote client, but I didn't say to my application, where is the remote endpoint? I don't know where is the server. So how do I do uh, that? Let's go, be here, go back here. Application properties, and I need to add a new property. I need to say that my com Red Hat developers, developers, hello, client slash MEP REST slash URL is going to be HTTP localhost 881. And if I type it everything correctly, I can, can go back here. And it's working. Yes, it's returning the remote. Hello. What happens if my remote endpoint goes down? I can just stop it, go back to my browser, and now it's giving me an error. Let's try to be more resilient. If you ever try to use a, a circuit breaking implementation, for example, Hystrix, you know that I, need to, I could be using a fallback. Luckily, MicroProfile provides for us some standard API. So if I go back here, I can add like an at fallback annotation. So I'll be using the default circuit breaker uh, values. And let's, uh, the fallback method is going to be, let's try to be original fallback. And as long as I return the same type, it should be good. Return, hello, I'm alive. Okay, so I added the fallback, go back to my browser, refresh, last, yes, it's working. What happens if I put my services to run back again? Yes, Faro. And yes, hello. It should be back working remotely, or else it will resort to the fallback. Okay? That's some of the capabilities that I can sh show to you with Quarkus. And the secret with Quarkus for being so fast is that Quarkus doesn't do anything at lazy, in a lazy way. Actually, we're eager. Uh, the magic behind Quarkus is not at runtime, the magic ab ab around Quarkus is at, at uh, build time. And the magic is everything is contained in the Quarkus Maven plugin. So if you think about that, there are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of things that needs to be done in a runtime where you're booting your Java application. You need to do some class path scanning. You need to get your gather your metadata. You need to use reflection to gather this metadata. Then you need to build your dependency graph. After you do that, you need to instantiate your beans. You need to process the events. And after you did all of that, your application is running. And if you think about that, all of this information is already available at build time. So we thought that wh why can't we do this at build time? Why do we have to pay this cost of initialization every time we run our application? So the, Marvel, Ma the Quarkus Maven plugin process all of that in a very fast way. You've seen that it takes like just a few seconds to build the application. And once you do that, we just optimize the bytecode, we streamline the bytecode. And when, once your Quarkus application is booting, we only have to run this thing because everything else is already ready. And uh, why didn't we create something like Quarkus five, ten years ago? Uh, some of the key historic reasons is that with Java 6, for example, uh, well, Java was super slow. Uh, reflection used to be very slow and still consumes a lot of memory. But with Java 5, it was even super slow. With Java 6, reflection improved a lot. So like uh, reflection became less slow than before. So we didn't have time to think about another options. Also, uh, five years ago from now, compiler technology evolved a lot, so compilers became much more efficient and faster. So that's why we were capable of creating Quarkus today. So Quarkus does all of that at build time. It doesn't leave uh, anything or does most of the things at build time. That's why it's capable of being so fast. And also, it's a very good match for GraalVM. 
Because Grubby has some, has some limitations, and I said before, if you ever try to compile a project to native using GraalVM, you know that it requires a lot of configuration and most projects doesn't work with GraalVM. If you're using Quarkus, we did all of the have lifting for you. You don't have to configure anything. If you're using one of the Quarkus extension, this is the first, uh, uh, first set of extensions that was released when we launched Quarkus. But Every two weeks, we're releasing a new version, and the community is contributing a lot of new extensions uh, to this set. For example, after one week of Quarkus, somebody from Latin America decided, oh, I want to use database migrations with Quarkus. Uh, but Flyway doesn't work with Quarkus. Well, uh, we could use some help if you could contribute to your own extension. So this developer from Latin America, he decided to create his own extension. He published, created published on GitHub, uh, on GitHub and is already available on the Quarkus platform. That's why if you want to use Flyway with Quarkus, uh, even on native mode, you can use that with the platform. Another common question is that, can I use any library with Quarkus? Yes, if you're using Quarkus on Hotspot VM. But you need to be, uh, you need to know that the Quarkus part will be super fast and super small. The, the library that is not quarked, if it's using reflection, very likely it's going to be uh, consuming more memory, it's going to be slower. Uh, okay, on native mode, then you have some restrictions which I'll be able to explain exactly how does it work and what are the restrictions and how uh, on the next session. So the next session, in the next session, I'm going to talk about how Quarkus work. So if you want to know the magic behind Quarkus, how we created all of these optimizations, what are the limitations of Graal VM and how we overcome all of these limitations, please stay for the next session. But for now, that's what I uh, had to say about Quarkus. And uh, well, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm available for some questions. Currently, you have shown some patterns for complex applications such as uh, fault tolerance and resiliencies, all those things. Does Quarkus, keeping aside the things of optimization, does keep, uh, Quarkus try to address all the patterns in a comp complex application such as the service discovery, all those things, log aggregations? client-side discovery or server-side discovery. I'm just trying to compare this thing with a Spring Cloud, actually, mm -hmm. in microservices world. So Spring Cloud already has a large community behind this. They have already addressed all the microservices pattern. How, what value Quarkus is trying to add on their behalf of, the, on, on top of these patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yes, for example, how does Quarkus come, uh, I think the question is how Quarkus uh, can be compared to, for example, the Spring Cloud OSS yeah. Uh, stack yeah, for uh, applications. Well, uh, we believe that if you're using Quarkus, uh, you have all of the capabilities for to, create, to be able to create cloud native applications these days. If you think about the runtime in which you're deploying your applications, uh, for example, Kubernetes won the container orchestration platform war. war. Everybody, all of the vendors are using Kubernetes these days. So we think that if a feature is being provided by the platform, you don't need to uh, implement that on the application code. Okay? So yes, uh, server side load balancing is going to be provided by the platform, for example, Kubernetes. Uh, yes, we have circuit breaking, even though uh, like you have two different operating models, you can use circuit breaking with your codes. I believe that for most applications, it's better to use circuit breaking in the platform, but you can choose both. What uh, service discovery also is provided by the platform Kubernetes. What we don't have here at Quarkus, for example, is client side load balancing, which is, uh, from our experience, is a, is a feature that like 99, 95% of the customers don't really use. Like client side load balancing, it's very interesting if the latency between your remote endpoints varies between invocations, so you can constantly be pinging the ones, but if your applications are consuming your services internally in the same cluster inside your company, or you have constant latency between your endpoints, server-side load balancing is a much better approach, okay? So this is the, I think this is one of the features that we don't support, at least we don't add with Quarkus, but of course, uh, Quarkus is 100% hundred open, uh, hundred open source as everything that Red Hat does. We would be very happy, for example, if somebody uh, contributed something for Ribbon or Eureka or like that. Yeah, but, but there may be chance at certain in complex applications at certain point of time, you are stuck with Quarkus and you don't have any other choice. For example, if I give, give you an example of uh, the moment microservices started in 2013, the first and foremost pattern was, was the service discovery. 
Okay, uh, so you cannot hard code uh, URLs, all those things in distributed world in your application, right? Oh no, you would use the most efficient service discovery mechanism like DNS uh, since ever. Okay. Yeah, but uh, uh, Spring Cloud already gives out of box implementation of such all those patterns. And I mean, I mean to say, it should not be at certain point of time we are saturated with the core cause and we don't have any choice. We can't do anything. And in Spring Cloud, I think they have a lot of pattern. They have large community behind this, of course, and they're developing from last four to five years this thing. And they have all the patterns. Mm -hmm. No, I love Spring Cloud. Yeah. I'm just saying that <laughs> everything that they do, we can do too. Like, it's, a matter, it's a matter of choice. I don't want you to, oh no, Spring Cloud, don't use it. I think both of our valid options. Actually, there are a lot of different use cases which we cover uh, too. So I think it's just a matter of choice. Yeah. And if you think about that, it's very good to have choices because, uh, well, you were stuck in a single implementation, single provider. You only had like one option for developing applications. Now you have more than one, one that is super fast and super small and consumes. Well. So we have our benefits too. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. First of all, thanks for the beautiful talk. Uh, okay. I would like to understand what is the strategy strategy behind. How it, is doing, how it is doing the hot reloading? The hot reloading? Yeah. Oh, Quarkus, uh, the hot reload approach, actually it was very easy to implement because we just monitor the file system. Every time you change a Java class or a resource, for example, we just recompile the project, stop and start again. So there's no magic because Quarkus, uh, it wasn't the goal of the project, but once the project was running, we realized, oh, Quarkus is so fast, why don't we add this feature? So that's all we do. We just monitor and restart everything. We don't have any magic. We recompile everything, stop, and start again. Okay. But if you want to know why Quarkus is so fast for compiling and starting, then you have to check the next session. I'll show the magic. Well, it's not magic. It's just very advanced technology. Yeah, how do we add uh, more security features like uh, adding rate limiter to the server, uh, to the service and running it on the HTTPS and all those stuff? Okay, how do I add HTTPS and? And the security features around that one. Security? Uh, security features, rate limiting and all those stuff. Oh, rate limiting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we also think that rate limiting is something provided by, by the platform. Uh, SSL, yes, uh, we have support. Uh, we have, if you want authentication, authorization, we support JSON Web Tokens, Keycloak, and uh, last week they added another security implementation. Uh, I didn't even check the website, I just saw that there's another option. So these are the big features, but rate limiting using, usually is provided by an API, API management software, like throttling, rate limiting, and all of these policies. Yeah, it is just not about the rate limiting. Uh, also, the latest cipher source and uh, the other stuff, algorithms that we use. For latency or, so latency or something? Uh, so let's say SSL uh, version 3, so all the stuff. OK, SSL version, TLS. Yeah, yeah. OK, TLS. Yes, we support TLS even, uh, even on native mode, yes. Uh, we have support for that. So it wouldn't be an, wouldn't be an issue, but Again, if you're running on top of like Kubernetes, it's usually usually uh, you can use here, but usually the TLS endpoint terminates on on the on the gateway and not on the internal endpoints. But you can use both approaches. Okay, uh, once if you use end-to-end -end TLS, it's hard to load balance the stuff. Like you have like limited options for load balancing, but we support both options. Both both options. And I think we're, our time is up. It's a very advanced talk. Okay, but thank you very much.